Hello everybody and thank you for joining me on this new video presentation. Before starting the presentation, I would like to invite you to visit my website for interesting EP cases and also the highlight of the latest top published articles in the field of cardiology, electrophysiology and digital health. Arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy has a prevalence of 1 in 5000 and is characterized by frequent sustained ventricular arrhythmias progressive ventricular dysfunction, and a high risk of sudden cardiac death. Patients typically present between ages 12 and 15 with symptoms associated with ventricular arrhythmias. However, pediatric and elderly cases have been also described. This is an interesting review that describes current understanding of the genetic architecture of arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy and its mechanisms of pathogenesis. An emerging threshold model for ACM inheritance in which multiple factors, including pathogenic variants in known ACM genes, genetic modifiers and environmental exposures, particularly exercise, are required to reach a threshold for disease expression. So this figure summarizes the disease mechanisms known in arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. The most frequent encountered mechanism is remodeling of intercalated disc. These include mutations in the mesosomal region and also gap junction, sodium channels and adherent junction. In addition to intercalated disc remodeling, we have also some dysregulation of calcium handling, which leads to decreased myogenesis and increased apoptosis, fibrosis, and adipogenesis. The next mechanism is decreasing and downregulation of microRNA 184, which results in adipogenesis and apoptosis. The next known mechanism is disturbance in signaling pathways which also results in apoptosis and increased fibrosis. And the last but not least is the autoimmunity to the mesosomal region, which has been described in some variants of arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. On the right side of this figure, we see the 2019 HRS expert consensus statement on evaluation, risk stratification, and management of arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. In this article, there is a list of recommended genes that we have to screen in affected member of the family to find out the possible mutations in these patients. We have to remember that if a family has multiple members, the individual with the youngest presentation or most severe disease should ideally be tested first to maximize detection of families in which more than one pathogenic variance is segregating. We have to remember that genetic testing for individuals with a low probability of ACM is not advisable as any variance detected in these patients is likely to be of uncertain clinical significance. Here is our patient, a 28-year-old man with electrical storm due to recurrent therapy refractory monomorphic Wheaties, who was admitted for catheter ablation. Here is the baseline ECG of the patient, which shows epsilon wave an inverted T wave in precordial leads. We have to remember that low QRS voltages in the limb leads can be an ECG marker predictive of left ventricular involvement in arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. To compare the ECG of our patient with another one, I would like to present the baseline ECG of a 30-year-old man who was admitted to our hospital due to sustained left atrial tachycardia. I will present this patient next week on my website. And on the next slide, we will see the baseline ECG. When we look at this ECG, we can see 
similar changes compared to previous ECG. However, this patient has no arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. So it means that um, just having some ECG changes doesn't mean that the patient has arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. What was the underlying disease uh, in this patient? We will see it next week. The increasing risk of misdiagnosis resulting from the inappropriate use of the criteria has prompted international experts to critically review the clinical performance and highlight the potential limitations of current criteria and to propose some solutions for a better clinical use and to identify potential areas of improvement with particular reference to diagnosis of left-sided phenotypes and identification of early disease in the pediatric population. And I would uh, like to recommend you looking at this interesting review. Here is a list of differential diagnosis of arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. There are some mimics of right dominant arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy including primary arrhythmia conditions like Brugada syndrome and some structural diseases like congenital heart disease and athlete's heart and also chest deformity and pericardial absence. We have also some mimics of left dominant type of arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy which includes different structural diseases like dilated cardiomyopathy, myocarditis and sarcoidosis. Here we see the clinical VT of our patient with a cycle length of 320 milliseconds, showing a left bundle branch block pattern, morphology in precordial leads with late transition, superior axis, and a very positive uh, QRS in lead one, which suggests uh, an origin on the right ventricular free wall. Here we see three-dimensional electroanatomical mapping in RAO projection. From left to right, we see bipolar endocardial map, unipolar endocardial map, and finally bipolar epicardial map. Here we see late potential mapping in RAO projection on the epicardial side of the right ventricle. Last but not least, I would like to present this recent study. The authors aim to assess a structural progression in arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy patients and also mutation positive family members and its impact on arrhythmic outcome in a longitudinal cohort study. At genetic diagnosis and inclusion, 58% of the family members had penetrant arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. During seven years of follow-up, 47% of family members without arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy at inclusion developed arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy criteria, which result in a yearly new AC penetrance of 8%. It was very interesting to see that a structural progression rate was similar in family members and probands. So, that was my presentation and I would like to thank you again for joining me and hope to have you here in my future video presentations.